everyone. Welcome to the Digital Leadership Changing Paradigms for Changing Times featured session. I'm Sandra DeCastro and I will serve as your IMS host this afternoon. It is my great pleasure to introduce Eric Schinniger as our featured speaker. Eric is an innovator, best-selling author, and associate partner with the International Center for Leadership and Education. His work focuses on leading and learning in the digital age. I'm sure you'll enjoy his talk this afternoon. Eric, over to you. All right, and thank you, Sandra, for the nice, brief, concise introduction, which means more time for me. And uh, really excited to be here with you uh, today, but I am a, a stickler for time, so I'm going to hit my timer because what I want to do is I hopefully want to leave some time for questions. So um, my goal is to leave some time, but you just never know. But I will give you another option to ask me questions at any time, anywhere, whenever you want. All right, so let's get things started, everyone. Uh, as you heard, my name is Eric. Uh, I am from the Northeast, live in Texas now, but I am currently on location in Provo, Utah, uh, where I've been working with schools on personalized learning this week. But, uh, you know, if you want to ask any questions uh, at any time, please use that hashtag. I will answer them. Also, my direct messages on Twitter are completely open. So uh, if you want to follow me on Twitter, great. Even if you're not, you can still get to me. And I promise I will respond. Now, I have that there just in case we run out of time. So why am I here today? I kind of shouldn't be. I was the person that <coughs> thought I had it all figured out. I didn't believe in any of this stuff that I now work with schools across the world on, but also what we implemented in my former school. And, you know, when we think about change, we think about leadership. You know, leadership is not about position, title, or power. Leadership is about action. And I began to take different actions when in 2009, I was running through my building because a student broke our cell phone policy and he was terrified of me because he knew if I got the phone, I was gonna keep it till the end of the year. I was a bully. So he's running, I'm running, I catch up to him. And I had my assistant principal on the walkie talkie. So he helped and I said, give me a device. And he said, thank you, Mr. Scheninger for creating a jail out of what should be a school. That was the first sort of <coughs> lesson that I got that was, were my actions inhibiting or promoting a positive school culture. So <coughs> a little bit after that, I uh, was home reading a newspaper article in Staten Island where I used to live and it was about Twitter. And I swore I would never be on social media because I don't have time. It's not going to help me. And this would be the dumbest thing any speaker ever says. Twitter changed my professional life. I saw how a tool could help me be a better communicator. You won't find an effective leader who is not an effective communicator. And I got on social media to give my parents, stakeholders information. And then I got creepy. I can't see you right now, but I know there's creepy people out there like me. You lurk. I lurked in the shadows and I learned how far behind our school was. I learned schools, organizations, districts doing amazing things with and without technology. We weren't doing any of it. And I learned that leadership begins with me. So I began to learn how to unlearn and relearn. And we started that back in 2009, five years later. We were the first school in New Jersey to go bring your own device. Personalized learning, blended learning, we were doing that all 11 years ago with a population that spoke 40 different languages. One third of our population classified special needs. All these challenges. I am here, not because of what I did, but because of what my teachers did. We innovated, we used digital tools with purpose, but we improved achievement in the process. And that's what we're gonna talk about today, everybody. We're gonna talk about how do we need change in this crazy world? And I told you my story because mindset often gets in the way of either progress or that willingness to take risks. But I have to tell you all, thank you for being here today. Thank you for still showing up for kids. Thank you for what you do to support schools because you all have gone through this most challenging time in education. But when we think about leadership, we think about change, you know, we have to look at well, what really defines you all as educators. You know, we can look at many elements that are, that are integral 
for leadership in a classroom, school, district, or organization. But one thing that you all have shown in a world where many of you were thrust to use technology, even if you weren't trained or didn't believe in it, was your resilience. In the face of adversity, what do all educational leaders do regardless of title or position? You find a way to move forward. And that's the key when we think about digital leadership, it is being resilient, understanding that things change. We had change before the pandemic, but you all right now, regardless of where you are, you have this clean slate moment, everybody. There is no better time to transform teaching, learning, and leadership. Pandemic, fourth industrial revolution, all this change. The key is, where is your mindset? You know, mindset frames everything. I told you my short story because it was fixed. Then I had my aha moments. And that's when things really took off. The key here, everyone, are you willing to look through a different lens in order to grow and improve and take advantage of everything that the digital age has to offer? Here's what I mean by that. I used to be a cat. Every day the same. I'd be aloof to lunch then coldly indifferent after. To me, everything was just, yeah. Then it hit me. Why be so cat? Why not be a bit more dog? I mean, look at the world today. It's amazing. Running, amazing. Chasing cars, amazing. Sticks, amazing. Carpe diem. It means grab the frisbee. Maybe we should all be a bit more dog. Be more dog. Are you ready to be more dog, everybody? Hey, you already have been because of where you are right now during a pandemic. But we have to tackle our number one adversary and the one that kind of leads to the most dangerous phrase in education, that's the way we've always done it. Now I'm not saying what we've done in the past isn't effective, but often when we are faced with doing something differently, uh, ma excuses materialize, the yeah buts. That video is all focusing about focusing on the what if everybody. Because when you focus on the what if, anything is possible. And as we go through, I'm going to break down this sort of journey of digital leadership into four different sections. But I want to be very clear, everybody. Good teaching is good teaching. Learning is learning. Leadership is leadership. Those three things have not changed. What's changed is the environment in which you teach the environment in which your kids and you learn, and the environment in which you lead. And why? Well, a little bit has to do with the pandemic, but a lot of it has to do with all these digital tools and the technology we have available. So we got to begin the journey by leaning in to learning and understand if we want to improve outcomes, if we want to use technology with purpose, if we want to allow our schools and organizations to personalize the process for kids, we got to build that foundation. And that foundation is all relational. And when we begin the process to get kids to think, apply their thinking in relevant, meaningful ways, and use technology to support and enhance those, those aspects, we got to remember why we do what we do. And we got to understand that some days kids are going to drive us crazy. They're going to make us rethink what we do. All kids have greatness hidden inside of them. It's a job of an educator to help them find and unleash that greatness. So we begin leaning into learning to set the stage for digital leadership by building those relationships. But then also it's having clarity. Clarity in terms of not just what we do, but for our students to have that clarity. You know, system change relies on a common vision, common language, common expectations. And how those three areas, you know, manifest themselves in the classroom, in a school, in a district, in an organization. Here was our motto in my former high school in New Jersey. Keep it simple, stupid. We were all over the place, everybody. 
if you want to really, you know, maximize or take advantage, unleash the potential of technology, we got to come back to what's not debatable. Vertical access, get our kids to think. They need it now, they're going to need it in the future. Get our kids to apply their thinking in relevant and meaningful ways where it's across disciplines, applied to real, predictable, unpredictable situations. At ICLE, we call this quad D learning. By the way, D is a place you visit once in a while. But ask yourselves, how are you getting your kids to think in your classroom, your school? How are you getting them to apply their thinking before the digital piece? So as we dive into that vertical axis here, I'm sorry, the horizontal axis, that's relevance. And I'll tell you right now, relevance is the fuel of learning. Without relevance, <laughs> it can be draining. And here's what I mean when learning is not relevant for you as adults or for our learners. It kind of looks like this. Oh my goodness, I don't want you to be that polar bear today. We don't want our learners to be that polar bear in class. I visit thousands of classrooms a year. I, I'm very blessed to be able to work shoulder to shoulder with all of those, all of you who are doing the work. And if I want to determine if a lesson's relevant, I ask the kids. And it's not, can they tell me what they learned? Can they tell me why they're learning it and how they will use it outside of school? You know, leadership is about creating those conditions where kids want to learn. They see the value. They see the connections. Does the lesson have meaning? Now, relevance is important, but so is rigor. Not rigor mortis, not strict, not inflexible but rigor in terms of how do we challenge kids to think? How do we understand that rigor means different things to different learners? I don't like the term learning disabled. I believe kids learn differently. But regardless of where our kids are, we need to scaffold our questions, scaffold our tasks, think about our assessments. And yes, it's questions that we as the adults ask, but if learning is rigorous and relevant, kids will develop their own questions. And as we think about building this foundation, then we start looking at the digital piece. What I focused on is what we know is important, what the research says is important. But when we think about technology, this comes from a grade six teacher in North Carolina. Bill Farida reminds us, technology is a tool, everybody. It's not a learning outcome. So as you lead change from your position, two questions. How are your students using technology to learn in ways they couldn't without it? How does your use of technology represent a fundamental improvement over what you've done without it in the past? And Bill provides some great guidance here, but I kind of want to tone it down a little bit more because I really believe in clarity and it's pedagogy first, technology second. Technology can unleash the potential of potential of our learners, but we want to make sure there's rigor and relevance. Then, oh my goodness, on the left, that's a first grader. First grader in Seesaw, where the task was, use your sight words to design a classroom where your peers learn best. Oh my goodness. High rigor, high relevance. Kids are creating. They're using their sight words. They're voicing over, using their sight words in a sentence. Awesome. On the right, that's closure in third grade. After an activity on inferences, kids scanned the code. They went on a tool called Mentimeter, and every kid was able to make an inference. On the left, first grade. First grade where the kids for closure got to draw their response in Nearpod. They got to choose how to show that they've learned by drawing it any way they want. On the right, that's a middle schooler using Kahoot. Not where he can answer as fast as possible. Who, what, where, when? Nope. This student is processing a word problem because we worked in this district on the rigor. It's not a race anymore. Our kids thinking. Here you see more examples. And a lot of these are from Corinth, Mississippi. I've been blessed to be their coach for the past three years. We worked on rigor and relevance. We empowered their teachers, their leaders. We improved feedback, but we also created artifacts that just show good teaching. On the left, there's a student solving math problems, then going on Kahoot. On the right, 
kids are annotating in Padlet together, those that are remote and those that are face-to-face. -face. Every kid involved. Eighth grade math in Corinth, Mississippi, kids are working at their own pace on translation activities in Google Slides. The teacher is able to see in real time what kids are struggling. And that determines how he uses his time to support the kids that need it the most. And this is what high school looks like in Corinth, Mississippi. On the left, an activity to get kids set, to get them ready. They're analyzing graphs and then responding on Mentimeter. On the right, same class. The kids are answering questions, commenting on each other's answers using Nearpod. What was I trying to show you, everybody? Nothing radically new. I showed you great examples of good instruction. I showed you technology being used with purpose. And here's the thing, everyone. Technology will not improve every lesson. It won't make you a great teacher, a great administrator. The key is how to support and enhance what we know already works. Through the work of my staff, we developed the iteration of this version of the Rigor Ellis framework. Again, when technology is being used by the kids, are they using it to think? And how are they using it to apply their thinking in relevant and meaningful ways? By the way, I am going to send, you're going to get a copy of the slide deck. I'm going to send it to Sandra later, today or tomorrow. You're going to get all this for you to refer to. And again, I'm not here to tell you what to do. I'm here to get you to think about what you do. Why do you do it that way? How can you do it better? And the words of Michael Fullan when it comes to digital, pedagogy is the driver, technology is the accelerator. Work inside out, everyone. Get those kids to think. Look at your questions. Look at your tasks. Look at your assessments. Think about the verbs and actions. And the last thing, the last thing to do is select the tool. In essence, when we talk about leaning into learning in the digital age, digital leadership is about creating a culture in your classroom or school that doesn't prepare kids for something. The goalposts are constantly moving. The world's evolving. It's about preparing them for anything. Future-proofing learning so the kids have the competencies to be successful, no matter what's thrown at them. So as you think about how you are leaning into learning and where there's opportunity to grow, another thing we got to think about is, okay, we can improve instruction, which is what the teacher does, but how do we improve learning, what the kids do? How do we create cultures that meet the needs of all learners? And let's talk about experience. We are all shaped by experience, for better or for worse. We learn from experience. I want to show you an experience that happened four years ago that is all too relevant today. No, I would argue that this is a triumph of democracy. Scandals happen all the time. The question is, how do democracies respond to those scandals? Uh, and what will it mean for, uh, for the wider region? I think one of your children has just walked in. I mean, shift this, shifting, shifting sands in the region, do you think relations with the North may change? Um, I would be surprised if they do. <laughs> the, um, pardon me. My apologies. What is this going to be for the region? My apologies. North, uh, sorry. North Korea, North and uh, South. So, this happened four years ago, but all of us experienced all the Zooming and WebExing and Google Hangouts. So, he probably learned, yeah, I got to lock the door. I got to double lock the door. I got to make sure someone's watching the kids. And as we learn from experience, I think we all had our own instances of Zoom interruptions and those experiences shaped our thinking and it led us to making different decisions. Now, all kidding aside, all jokes aside, what am I trying to get at in terms of experience? What does the experience look like in your classroom or school? Digital leadership is not about giving every kid a device. That's equality. Digital leadership isn't about every kid getting really good direct instruction where they're using tools to respond. That's equality. Digital leadership is about ensuring equity. Now, the top, all kids doing the same thing at the same time, the same way. Or all kids getting the same thing. Equity is all kids getting what they need, when and where they need it. 
And that's where there's so many pathways that digital can provide to create an equitable environment in order to personalize learning. Personalization is not every kid on an adaptive learning tool and say, yeah, yeah, we personalized. Personalization is a move from the what we teach, what's in the curriculum, what's on a test to who, our learners, to emphasize ownership. Personalization is using high agency strategies, path, pace, place, voice, and choice to help all learners get what they need when and where they need it. And there's so many different strategies to personalize. And by the way, you don't need technology to personalize. Smaller learning communities, academies are great ways without tech to personalize. But it's how do we give kids a path to choose from? How do we understand that the place could vary? What am I trying to talk about? Well, let's talk about some strategies. Let's look at some examples. What is one of the best ways to personalize learning, to create an equitable culture? Blended learning. Now, let me make a distinction between blended instruction and blended learning. Blended instruction is what the adult does with tech. For example, I have all of you in a classroom, I'm doing my lesson, and then I have you all go on Kahoot and use Kahoot at the same time, the same way. Now, that's not bad per se, but that's an instructional strategy. Blended learning is where all students use technology to control some aspect of path, pace, and place. The learning piece is important. Remember, learning is what the students do. Instruction is what the adult does. So what could it look like? You could use the station rotation model in your classroom. You could help your teachers use the station rotation model where you're collecting good data and you're using data to group, regroup, provide target instruction. Here, you see all those colors. This is from my home district in Cypress Fairbanks, Texas. This is Wells Elementary School. They do, they are one of the most amazing blended learning campuses in this country because there is evidence of how they're using data, but also their standardized test scores are off the charts. There's a timer for pacing. And here you're moving away from all kids doing the same thing at the same time. So you can look at station rotation and I thought I had a slide there, but I did not. Or you could do choice activities. And I say choice activities is a great way to personalize but you know, it doesn't have to be a choice board. It could be a must do, may do. This is kindergarten in Bullitt County, Kentucky. This is what they were doing during the pandemic. Look at this kindergarten, choose a task from each color, upload evidence in your seesaw account. We're big on evidence, evidence to validate our practices and validate learning. But one of the best examples of a choice board. So you could do station rotation, and behind the choice board, the teachers are providing one-on-one -on -one intensive support for the kids that need it the most. You know, blended learning is about maximizing the time that we have with our kids when they're in school. This is a fourth grade choice board in Canvas in Corinth, Mississippi. And what you will see everybody is they all look different. This is a choice activity in eighth grade in Corinth, Mississippi. And I love this, this is a veteran teacher and you know, as I go in, I, I do my coaching. The principal then sets up different areas to focus on. And what I'm showing you is the evidence, the evidence of how building leadership and teacher leadership work together to transform culture. And here you see, this is a template she uses. They got their Zoom meetings up the top. They have the daily must do, their weekly must do. Then they go on and pick their choices. This is after the teacher does 10 to 15 minutes of direct whole group instruction. And you're still teaching everybody, but you see the bottom there? You can, kids can go back and get what they need from all the prior weeks. Here's a choice board in high school biology. And you, know, you could see the tasks and look at them. You look at those tasks, there's rigor and relevance in all of those options, everybody. And that's the key. You know, the one thing is I talk to these teachers and I talk to the principals, the superintendents, they all say, Eric, we could never go back to the way that we used to do things. Yeah, there's a little work up front, but then it's just tweaks going forward. We know more about where our kids are because of the convergence of good instructional strategies, the use of digital tools to personalize 
through blended strategies. And it doesn't have to be station rotation or choice activities. It could be a playlist. This is my daughter's fifth grade math teacher. And after his lesson, kids would go through these activities. They get to choose the order. Now they're doing all the tasks, but once they are done, they go on this Google sheet and they find their name and they color it in. The teacher's calling kids one-on-one -on -one with their whiteboards based on a, a benchmark data to provide that targeted support. And then all these examples, everybody, station rotation, choice, playlists, there's typically a three question scaffolded formative assessment done in Google Forms, Canvas Forms, or whatever tool, so the teacher can evaluate the effectiveness of that lesson. And the, lead, the building leaders can give more feedback. I showed you a few of the thousands of examples I have. Amazing practices are taking place. We have so, you have so much to be proud of. But the pathway to digital leadership is thinking about how we meet the needs of all kids. And this is for you to evaluate where are you as a teacher? If you're an administrator, where's your building? Where's your district? Where's your organization? And this isn't to say, don't do stuff on the blue. Blue is bad. Don't reside in blue, everybody. Yes, blue is that's the way we've always done it. There's a time and a place for blue, but look for opportunity. Look for opportunity to shift your practice. Be more dog. Take those risks. Look for feedback. Ask for feedback. Give feedback. And always ask questions. So as you think about transforming practice, transforming teaching, digital leadership, lean into learning, meeting the needs of all. But we also got to be better than before. Here's the thing, everybody. Every single one of us can get better. And the first step to getting better is to understand that, hey, we learn lessons by watching our students, watching our teachers, implementing ideas, whether they work or not. Lessons are learned every day. It's what we do with those lessons to inform our practice that matter. Let me show you a lesson that the soccer player learned the hard way. Oh my goodness, lesson learned. Don't celebrate too soon. What is the lesson when it comes to professional learning? It's not just about personalizing for your students, everybody. It's how do you personalize learning for you? Where you get what you need, when you need it, where you need it. And it's a balancing act, everybody. Yes, district school needs are usually impacted by state or federal mandates, but it's also what do you need? What do you need as a teacher? What do you need as a principal? What do you need as a superintendent? What do you need as someone who supports all of those areas? And it's about finding that sweet spot. And as we think about the convergence of effective professional learning, yes, the research has told us job embedded ongoing professional learning is what gets results. No one and done, no drive by, job embedded ongoing. But what can you do on your own? How do you become better than before by personalizing the experience and using the resources that you have in a digital world? Now, you don't have to like Nick Saban. You don't have to like Alabama. You don't have to like football. Powerful quote. I didn't invent any of this stuff. I learned it from somebody. So I'm always looking for the next person I'm going to learn something from. Who is your next person? How do you get to them? How do you focus on your specific needs? How do you work smarter, not harder, in order to grow and improve? And that begins with being a digital leader. Understanding that you can create your own personal learning network. Now, on the right, that's how many of us were disconnected nomads when social media came about. But that's also what the world looked like and learning looked like before the internet. Now, I'm not saying it's bad, but the only way there were two-way flows of information were when you talked to people on the phone or came in contact with them at an event. Why would you choose right when you could learn anytime, anywhere with anyone you want? 
resources, ideas, strategies, ask questions, answer questions, get feedback. Oh my goodness. And all it takes is determining the amount of time that you want to spend and figuring out what tool you want to use. Twitter, LinkedIn, Pinterest, digital discussion forums like EdWeb. So many options, but look at all the two-way flows. Why is this important, everybody? Because if you're the smartest person in the room, then you're probably in the wrong room. And that's the key, everyone. Take advantage of all these resources. Digital leadership is about being nimble. It's about being resourceful. It's about getting what you need and you have it all there. Finally, as we think about digital leadership, we want to move change forward, not just in one classroom, not just in one school but across all of our classrooms, all of our schools. And it really begins with improving the work, but then sharing the work. And that's the key where sharing stories helps to move the masses. I said in the beginning how important communication was. Effective communication helps to achieve goals and engage families. Communication, effective, effective communication is the right information at the right time, the right way. It's also about body language and making powerful points. Let me show you what effective communication looks like because that begins the storytelling process. Here's one of my favorite communicators. I tell you. What? I'm pregnant. Huh? What, what were you thinking? Why you have to um, just, just get another baby? You just have two. So why do you, why, why do you, this is exasperating. Exasperated. Amaya. Because, he, because you just got two. So you don't, why do you want to place, why do you want to get another baby and replace one of your babies if there's too much? Oh, baby, we will never replace you and Amaya. You're just going to have another brother or sister that you have to take care of, will help take care of. That doesn't make no sense. Oh my goodness. Powerful point. Yes, we want to communicate. But we also know that, hey, if we're not telling our story, someone else will. And communication is the foundation to get our stories out there. In the animal kingdom, it's eat or be in. In the human kingdom, it's define or be defined. What I hope for all of you, you're doing great work, everybody. Don't let anyone ever tell you you're just a teacher. You're just an administrator. You impact lives. And I see this, this week alone, I saw so many amazing practices that align with everything that we talked about today. The key is to become the storyteller in chief. It's a choice, everybody. Don't look at it as bragging. You know what? Look at it as bragging. You have earned the right to brag about what you do because you dedicate sometimes more time to other people's children. You are making a difference. But if you want to move change, Digital leadership is about showing people what it looks like, how it can be done. And as we think about becoming the storyteller in chief, consistently sharing all the great stuff, it drowns out any mention of the bad. And that's, that, that is the truth, everybody. Be proud of what you do. Share, get feedback, amplify the great work that's happening in your respective environments. And as you think about how you can do it, I showed you pictures today. I showed pictures because I wanted it to be very clear that these practices were really good, that they align to thinking, application of thinking. But it's also strategic. The brain processes images faster than text, everybody, a lot faster than text. That's why images are a great strategy to share your story, to change the narrative. I also show you little videos. Now, short session today, but I got videos of teachers doing amazing things to align everything we talked about. But why did I show videos? Well, that's my way to compensate for the fact that I don't have any good jokes. But a one minute video is equal to almost 1.8 million written words. Use these assets you have available, everybody. And as I throttle down, digital leadership is about being proactive, not 
reactive. Don't wait for the right opportunity. Create it. Understand that the key to technology improving outcomes is purposeful use aligned to what we already do. And understand, hey, digital just supports what we know about effective leadership. Model the way. Don't ask others to do what you're not willing to do or have not done yourself. Show how it can do what we already do better. And, you know, as we think about these challenging times, leadership can be a lonely place, regardless of the lens or position you're leading from. But I need to remind you, everyone, please never underestimate the impact that you have on others. Continue to be a merchant of hope. And when you get down, I want you to think about this next video, this last video I'm going to show you. And it really is validation and a reminder of how all of us on the outside are so indebted every day to what you do. Don't look at the video through a famous basketball player. Look at it through what you do as digital leaders, as educators every single day. since I last seen you. I come from an area where not too many people make it. It was always my dream that I'd get the chance to go to college, but we just didn't have the money. You mean so much to us. And my brother, Joaquin, loved you from the beginning. He passed away in Parkland on February 14th. He was one of the 17 victims. 10 days before Christmas, our house burned down and we lost everything. It was one of the lowest points of my life. Hey, Dwight. How you doing, Miles? You were the joy of my life. But I was dropping the ball. That day that I just couldn't do it no more was the day that I was going to have to turn myself in. And I seen the tears just fall from your eyes. Your mama went down a road, Dwayne, that I didn't ever think I'd come back from. But on that road, I noticed you kept showing up. And you'll come and see about me. And Dwayne, because you believe in me, when I got out of prison, I was a different woman. We received a phone call. Would you mind if Dwayne Wade take you and the family <laughs> on a shopping spree? It just meant the world to me that you were there for us at this time. Thank you. you became our hero. A lot of the words that you said hit a spark and kind of change where I was going. Without you and your full tuition scholarship, none of this would have been possible. You're not way the basketball player, the legend. You're the human being that took the time and on his own, wrote my brother's name on his shoe, and you cared. When you bought your mama that church, you don't even understand the lives that you changed. So I don't have a jersey, but I brought you this. I don't have a jersey to trade with you, but I definitely have this, the blazer that I wore to my first job in. My cap and gown from graduation. This is important because Joaquin wore this in his last championship. My family wanted you to have it. Please don't forget my brother, Akeem. Having you as a role model has made all the difference. One of the special robes that you gave me, purple symbolized royalty, and you are royal in everybody's life that you've been touched. You completely changed the course of my life. I know my brother is with you always. It wouldn't have been possible to be here if it wasn't you. 
I am more proud of the man you have become than the basketball player. You are bigger than basketball. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for the long nights. Thank you for sticking with it when you've questioned, well, why did I go in education? Thank you for even as uncomfortable change can be, being more dog, looking at things differently. You know, your work is amazing. And because of you, everything is put in place. But just remember this, everybody, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. You know what digital leadership is all about? Acknowledging when you need help or acknowledging that you don't know. And understand everything comes down to relationships. Without trust, there's no relationship. Without relationships, no real learning occurs. And I am actually on my last slide, which is good for me. So uh, I will see, I guess I'll hear in a minute, if there are any questions, uh, they will be verbalized to me. And then I will transition away from this slide but just understand some things that, you know, that we're learning as an organization, the things that I'm seeing, you know, don't think you need to do it all yourself. Prioritize time, standards, SEL needs, continue to advance learning and equity in your schools with professional development and know and appreciate the impact you have. Yep, there's a book on this. If you want it, scan the code or go to that bit.ly. So, <coughs> oh, excuse me. So that is what I got. Now there's only like three minutes left. So, I don't know if there are questions. I'm going to try to model wait time, which I've gotten better at, and see if there's any questions from all of you. Eric, we might have time for one question if you have any. Don't be, don't be shy, everybody. There are um, no questions submitted, but uh, I think we could give it a few seconds just to see if any come in before we end the session, if you don't mind waiting. Oh, I don't mind. Hey, I built that time in. So sometimes though, everyone, the, the awkward silence. I know when I work with a group remotely and I get the awkward Zoom silence and oh, but, but again, everybody, this is your time. By all means, you don't have to have questions. Uh, you do know that there's my contact information. So you can ask me a question anytime. I had a principal send me a direct message through Twitter yesterday, working on a strategic plan. And he goes, well, you're probably not going to get back to me. <laughs> I got, I then got complimented for how quickly I got back to him. So that question is now great. If not, just know that it's a digital open door because we're all in this together, everybody. And the more we help one another, the more successful our schools will be. While we're waiting on Kara to give us a cue if there are any questions that came in, I just want to take this opportunity to thank you for this very and, and, um, insightful talk that you gave and encouraging us all to be more dog um, and just really a, a, applaud all the great things that you're doing and the work that you're doing with our districts. Um, Kara, any questions come in? No questions, but a comment, um, a few comments actually. Thank you for a great, inspiring, fantastic presentation. So um, looks like we're, we're right at time. So again, thank you, Eric. Thank you, Eric. Pleasure, and everybody. Thanks and for everyone, watching. I encourage everyone to jump over at five o'clock to the exhibit hall, um, five o'clock Eastern time to visit with all of our sponsors and to get the clues for today's trivia game. Um, excuse me, scavenger hunt. Um, so anyhow, um, thank you everyone. Enjoy the rest of your